Hi, welcome to Riverside Doctors Lecture Series for Lifelong Learning at CNU. My name is Stephanie Hertz. I am the Marketing Director at Warwick Forest, premier sponsor for the Lifelong Learning Society. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Bethany Edge. She is a registered dietitian at the Riverside Wellness and Fitness Center. She completed her education at Stephen F. Austin State University in Nacogdoches, Texas, where she specialized in integrative nutrition. Bethany is the proud wife of a United States sailor and a mother of an adventurous toddler. In her free time, she enjoys taking her dogs for long walks, exploring Virginia, and reading historical fiction novels. Today's lecture is entitled Nutrition for Brain Health. Enjoy. Okay. Well, good morning. Thank you to everyone for coming. Um, it's so exciting to see such a great turnout. And thank you for everyone who's joining us virtually. My name is Bethany Edge. I'm a registered dietitian here with Riverside. I work at the Riverside Wellness and Fitness Center, which is just up Jefferson away. And today I'm gonna to be talking about nutrition for brain health. This is something that I personally am very passionate about. It's probably one of my favorite topics when it comes to what nutrition can do to our bodies uh, or do for our bodies to help us improve our health. Um, there's a lot we can do. Um, not everything was, is within our control when it comes to our health, right? But by incorporating a few simple habits, we can really support our brains, give them the vitamins and minerals, all the carbs, protein, fat, the good nutrients that they need to optim work and perform at their optimal level. So today I'm just going to share a little bit with you about practical ways you can do that in your life. Today, we're gonna to start by reviewing my plate. We're gonna discuss the roles of different foods in promoting and protecting brain health. And this could be anything from mental health, right? Our moods, preventing anxiety, depression, um, to you know, preserving cognitive health and maintaining our memory and ability to learn. And then we're gonna talk about just some other wellness habits that can, may protect our brain health as well. So to start with the basics, I always like to go over my plate. You may have seen this posted at your doctor's office or different places. It's from the USDA. It replaced the food pyramid about 10 years ago. And the reason I like it is that it's a very visual way that we can look at our meals and see, do we have the variety that our bodies need to maintain health? Variety really is the spice of life. There's not a bad food group out there, contrary to what many diet trends may tell you. We need carbs from whole grains, from fruits, vegetables, dairy. We need adequate protein, especially from animal sources, which are going to be the largest contributor of protein to our diets. We need plenty of fiber, from fruits and vegetables, whole grains, and we even need fat in our diets. Fat is really important to brain health. So when we prepare our food, we can use healthy fats like olive oil. Um, a lot of people like guacamole, avocado goes great on top of food. There's lots of different ways we can make sure we incorporate those healthy fats to give our bodies all the different vitamins and minerals we need. Each of these food groups kind of has some star nutrients that they provide. And if we cut out one or we eat too much of one and it crowds out eating the other food groups, we're not gonna get the nutrition we need. And those nutrient deficiencies can be hard on our brains. It's kind of like if you are trying to, you know, build something and you don't have all the tools you need, it's gonna be a lot harder, right? So same thing in our bodies with all of our organs. If they don't have the tools they need to function optimally, they're not going to be able to. So we wanna give our brain variety, all the different food groups, all the different nutrients. Um, for individuals who have elevated blood glucose levels, so if your A1C is in the prediabetes or diabetes range, the American Diabetes Association recommends using a similar plate map. The only difference is that instead of a fruit and a vegetable, they recommend two servings of vegetables at every meal. So it's a half plate of vegetables 
And then instead of grains, it's considered a carbohydrate group. So you could have a quarter plate of fruit, a quarter plate of grains, a quarter plate of potato, just based on what you would like to have at that meal. Um, and in the handouts, we do have a low carb version. So that's the only difference is it has a picture of that plate map in there that is more appropriate for individuals who are trying to lower their A1C. But this is still a really healthy option. If you don't have blood sugar levels you can, um, that you're worried about, you can of course use my plate. So here's the example of the American Diabetes Associations. So we're gonna go through all the groups and just talk about what these foods do for our bodies. The first group is protein. Protein foods are meat, chicken, fish, eggs, and dairy foods are actually gonna provide some protein too. So cheese, milk, yogurt. Protein is really important because it provides the amino acid. So proteins in our bodies are broken down. The building blocks that make up proteins are amino acids. And this is what our body uses to form neurotransmitters. And neurotransmitters are components in our brain that help with our mood. They can play a role in different degenerative diseases. So we wanna make sure that they have the tools to make those neurotransmitters. And protein is also really important because it helps us feel satiated, plays a role in satiety. That's the feeling of feeling satisfied after a meal. Um, you may have eaten a meal without protein and, or a snack. I think snack is snacking is where a lot of us get caught and you find you're just eating and eating and eating and you feel like you've eaten a lot, but you just don't feel full, right? Probably because there's no protein. Protein is really important to getting that feeling of, oh, I've had enough. And protein plays a role in blood sugar balance. Now, blood sugar balance is really important to brain health. Even in individuals who do not have diabetes, we want to be mindful of our blood sugar levels. That doesn't mean you need to be testing your levels necessarily, but it just means we want to prevent our bodies from going too low, right? So when we have protein, and we're also going to talk about fiber and fat, they work together to study our digestion. So as food moves through our digestive tract, it's obviously broken down into all the different nutrients that our bodies can, are able to absorb, one of which is glucose. Glucose goes into our blood, and that's, you know, our blood sugar levels is how much glucose is in our blood. And that provides energy to all of our organs, all of our muscles, and of course, our brain. Our brain is the most glucose dependent organ in our body. So if we don't have a steady supply of glucose to the brain, the brain can get really tired and it can lead to a lot of physical stress on our bodies. Um, there's actually some research that shows hypoglycemia, blood sugar drops may play a pretty significant role in the development of anxiety and depression. So we wanna keep our mental health good, right? So we wanna keep our blood sugar levels steady. Um, so keep that steady stream moving through our digestive tract. So there's always sugar available to be absorbed into the bloodstream and available to our brain. So protein is really important. Every time we eat, whether it's a meal or snack, we should have protein. Yes. Cheese is not listed on here. Yes. Um, it's a smaller source of protein, uh, but it does provide some protein. And also on that note, you may notice I don't have beans listed on here. There's a lot of information about beans being a good source of protein, and they do provide pretty significant protein for a plant-based food. However, I <clears throat> personally recommend emphasizing animal proteins over plant-based proteins because they can provide a much higher quantity and quality of protein. So to get 20 grams of protein, which is kind of the minimum most of us need at a meal. That's a quarter pound of meat, which cooked down, it's like two to three ounces. It's really not a lot. So 20 grams of protein. To get the equivalent, you would have to eat two cups of beans. I don't know about you. I don't have time to eat two cups of beans. I don't have time to deal with the aftermath of having eaten two cups of beans. Try to do that three times a day. Not a good idea. 
So beans are really important. They are kind of the king of fiber. No other food provides as much fiber as beans. And fiber is really important in feeling full and having good blood sugar balance as well. It can also provide supplemental protein. So, you know, that really can help with stretching meat, especially I know food is getting so expensive these days. So they're a good supplemental source of protein, but I personally don't recommend relying on them as a main source of protein. I think it's really important that we always include some kind of animal source with our meals. If you want to use a smaller portion of meat, pair it with some beans, but get both if you can. Meat also is going to have all the amino acids. It's kind of a pre-packaged bundle of amino acids. Plant-based foods, they have proteins in them. They have amino acids in them, but they're not going to have all the amino acids our bodies need. So there can also be some nutritional gaps there. It all just comes back to variety. We need all the different foods, right? They all provide different things for us. Protein foods also provide a lot of important vitamins and minerals. B12, vitamin B12, this is exclusively found in animal foods. There are no plant-based foods that can provide vitamin B12. And deficiency is really common as we age, and it is associated with cognitive decline and depression. So it's really common for your doctor to talk to you about taking the B12 supplement, testing for that if you want a food-based source meat, fish, eggs, milk. Those are going to be what you go for. Omega-3 fatty acids. So this is found in fatty fish like salmon. Pasture-raised eggs and meat are also going to be higher in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, and omega-3s are associated with improved cognitive function and mental health. So it's really helpful to make sure we get enough of those in our diets. Um, just to get the minimum amount, if you eat fish once a week, that's a good goal. You'll probably be getting pretty close to what you need. Can we, uh, do you mind if we actually save questions for the end? Is that okay? Yeah. Um, so also iron and zinc, especially high levels in red meat, these are going to be associated with improved memory and attention. Choline. Choline is a nutrient you may or may not have heard of. It's not usually featured on lists of vitamins and minerals, but it is essential. And it's found in eggs, specifically the yolks and liver. So if you like liver, <laughs> here's your reason to eat it. Um, and it's often overlooked as a nutrient, but it's really important in brain development. And then it helps us retain our memory and brain health. So eggs, great food for young children as well. Tell your grandkids to eat their eggs. That'll help them be smart. Is eating protein foods a risk? So diet diversity is a really important part of getting all the nutrients the body needs to be healthy. And it's important to remember that <clears throat> nutrient deficiency can put us at risk for other diseases that can decrease our quality of life. It's kind of a balancing act. Too much of a good thing, you know, can be a bad thing too. Um, any food or nutrient can cause negative health consequences when eaten in excess. My plate encourages an appropriate intake of animal foods. So I know some of us may be concerned, um, but you know, a quarter plate portion, about a quarter pound to a third pound per meal is really not going to put you in that danger zone, especially if you're also eating plenty of fruits and vegetables, whole grains, beans, it's going to balance out that nutrient profile. The real problem that we have in America is a lot of us are eating nothing but like meat, potatoes, and bread. And as a consequence, we're not eating fruits and vegetables, which provide that diversity. Um, and also, you know, we're probably eating more than we would at a balanced meal. So if you're following my plate, you can safely include animal foods without worrying about excessive intake. Grains and beans. I like to include beans with grains just because they're a little bit more nutritionally similar to grains as far as what vitamins and minerals they offer. They're significant sources of fiber. They also provide carbohydrates, which if you remember, our brains need those carbohydrates to have the energy to do their jobs. And they provide lots of B vitamins. B vitamins play a really big role in energy metabolism. So making that glucose available to our brains. 
They also are great sources of fiber, which as we mentioned, supports blood sugar balance and healthy cholesterol levels. So great to have whole grains and beans in there. And beans, as we mentioned, can provide supplemental protein. And they also have um, high levels of minerals like iron and zinc that you would find in meat. So again, they're a really great supporting food. Um, B vitamins, specifically thiamine, riboflavin, and niacin. These are associated with good memory, problem solving, and sentence formation. And as I said, they play a role in energy metabolism. Folate is another nutrient. It is especially high in beans. And this is associated with improved cognition and mental health. So good to, you know, keeping our brains active and keeping our moods high. We're going to save questions for the end. So just take a note and um, I'll make sure we have time at the end. Betaine is another nutrient we may find in whole grains specifically. And this is a precursor to choline. So if you're like, I just can't do the eggs, maybe you're allergic or you hate the taste, whole grains is going to be your next best bet. Our bodies can convert betaine into choline. And again, this is really important to memory and just overall brain health. Vegetables are another really important part of the diet. A variety of vegetables can provide different nutrients that support cognitive function. They also are a great source of fiber, promotes blood sugar balance, healthy cholesterol levels, and good digestion. So, you know, it's not fun to have problems with constipation or diarrhea. Eating enough fiber will really help keep us regular. Feeds those bacteria that live in our gut so we have a healthy microbiome. That may also improve our mental health. So vegetables are really important in our diet. <clears throat> Leafy greens especially are going to be another great source of folate. So this was found in beans. Another great resource is leafy greens. Can help with cognitive function, preventing anxiety. Magnesium is a mineral that can be really hard to get from food. Um, but it's really important to eat leafy greens because it's a substantial source of magnesium. And deficiency is shown to play a role in anxiety, depression, and cognitive decline. So getting those leafy greens in, really helpful. Fruits are also a great source of fiber, natural sweetness. And um, of course, because of the sweetness, they provide carbohydrates, which feeds our brains. They also tend to be a really great source of vitamin C, especially citrus fruits like oranges, lemons, limes, strawberries, pineapple, great source of vitamin C. And vitamin C plays a role in serotonin and norepinephrine production. So these are two neurotransmitters. And of course, if we have adequate production, that's going to help with our brain health. Antioxidants also are found abundantly in fruits and vegetables. These are things like vitamin C as an antioxidant, vitamin E, selenium. Um, and these can be protective against oxidative stress. So oxidative stress, you may have heard of it. It's kind of a result of inflammation in the body and it can lead to DNA damage, um, which can contribute to a lot of health conditions. So cancer, there are certain mental health issues associated with oxidative stress in the body. Heart disease is associated with oxidative stress. So getting plenty of fruits and vegetables in is going to reduce our risk, improve our health all around. And last but not least is dairy. Dairy is the main source of calcium in the diet of most Americans. And dairy is another food I see getting a bad rap these days, but it is really important because we need calcium to protect our bones and to stay strong and independent as we age. Um, it can be substituted with another significant source of calcium, but it's really important that if for some reason we're gonna cut out dairy foods, whether that's we don't tolerate them very well or we don't wanna eat them for personal reasons, we really need to make sure we're finding another significant source of calcium. So cultures around the world that don't consume dairy uh, foods that are common in their cultures that provide calcium would be things like small fish bones. You can buy canned salmon and it's going to have the small delicate bones in it. And you could make like a salmon patty or something like that. Get your fish and omega-3s in as well. And 
a good boost of calcium. They're pretty soft, so they're easy to eat. Um, and, you know, don't really affect the taste too much if you can, you know, kind of get over the fact that you're eating bones, which is not as common in America. Insects is another source. And then there's a vegetable called moringa that is really common in some parts of Africa. That's a pretty significant source of calcium. You can also talk to your doctor about potentially supplementing calcium. I recommend that anytime we supplement, we want to have a lab that shows there's a real need someone is truly at risk of deficiency just because you don't want to waste your money on supplements you don't need. And when it comes to supplements, sometimes we can absorb too much and it can cause similar health problems to deficiency. So if you're going to take a calcium supplement, make sure you talk to your doctor, make sure he's, you know, running those labs so that, you know, um, it's, it's helping and to know if it's actually warranted. Zinc provides a lot of nutrients to our bodies. It can provide B vitamins. Again, those play a role in energy metabolism. So they help make that glucose available to our brain so they can function. Choline, great nutrient for brain health. Vitamin B12, which can only be found in animal foods. Zinc and magnesium, which magnesium is one of the common, uh, commonly deficient nutrients in the American diet. So great source of magnesium. And, you know, we've kind of talked a lot about all of these already. They all play a role in a healthy mind. So I wanted to give some examples because sometimes, you know, we can look at all of this be like, okay, that's great. But what does that actually look like? <laughs> you know, what should I actually eat? So everyone in here should have received a handout with a list of foods and all the different food groups. This is not an exhaustive list by any means. You're welcome to add in foods you like or cross out things you don't like. Please focus on the foods you like. I am all about enjoying our food and uh, you don't have to eat anything you don't like. Uh, but you know, just some inspiration. At every meal, we wanna try and have as much variety as possible. So these are some sample meals. The serving sizes are a little small because I found these examples on a, a website for feeding toddlers. So as a grown up, you would probably want to eat a little bit more <laughs> and that's okay. <laughs> um, but just to kind of give you some ideas. So for breakfast, you can have a piece of whole grain toast. That would be your whole grains, fiber, right? B vitamins, lots of carbohydrates to feed the brain. For protein, they have a fried egg. You could fry it in some olive oil to increase the healthy fats. Two eggs is an appropriate serving of eggs for grownups. They have a side of sauteed bell peppers as a vegetable. So a lot of people, vegetables for breakfast is kind of hard. If you can scramble them or saute them up with some eggs, I think that makes it palatable for a lot of people. Um, another option is sliced cucumbers. Cucumbers are kind of mild in flavor. So some people find they go well with breakfast, or if you just are like, Bethany, there's no way I'm not eating vegetables for breakfast. Just make sure you get a protein, carb, and fruit. You know, that would be most important. Um, or if eating a large breakfast is really hard for you, that I would say is kind of the minimum you would aim for, because you want to make sure you still have protein at every meal. So um, you know, just a piece of fruit and a piece of toast is not going to cut it. That's not going to have much protein. You really need to have something like an egg, hard boiled eggs are easy to prepare and have on hand. A cup of yogurt, Greek yogurt is especially high in protein. Um, even a protein shake may be appropriate for some people. And then they have peaches and they don't have it depicted, but just imagine they're drinking a glass of milk with this. So they have the dairy. You can also put some cheese on everything. So just sprinkle some cheese on those vegetables and the egg to make it tasty. And that could count as your dairy serving. For lunch, they have, again, sliced bell peppers. You could do celery sticks, uh, baby carrots or cut up carrots. They have some mixed berries for the fruit, blueberries, strawberries. Looks like some more. Did the mic go out? Okay. Um, and then for the grains, they have a whole wheat tortilla. And they 
put in it a wrap with some chicken. You could put in some cheese with it, a quesadilla. That would have your dairy and your grain. And they have some chicken on the side for some extra protein. Wraps are a great way to kind of get it all in one. You can put, you know, you have your whole grain. You could add in vegetables, maybe some leaves of lettuce, some sliced meat. Rotisserie chickens are another really great, easy way to make sure you always have some kind of protein on hand because you can just pull off pieces for, of the meat, put it in salads, wraps, soups, whatever you like. Um, you know, cheese on the wrap, roll it up, add an apple on the side. You've got everything. Um, I don't have a picture, but for snacks, kind of a simple formula that I recommend is find a protein food and then add a fruit and vegetable. So protein, good snack protein foods are usually things like cheese, yogurt, peanut butter, um, walnuts. Usually I'm thinking some kind of dairy or some kind of nut is really what's going to be easy to grab for most people. And then just pair it with some kind of fruit or vegetable. Apple slices with peanut butter is a classic combination. You could also do celery and peanut butter. Uh, cheese and cucumber slices, a handful of walnuts and grapes. I know a lot of people need an afternoon chocolate fix too. So great opportunity to just add in a few dark chocolate chips with your walnuts, make some really nice trail mix, and then have that with some grapes. So you're gonna have protein, fat, and fiber from that meal. The nuts are gonna provide protein, they're also going to have some fat and fiber. The grapes will have fiber. So it'll help you stay, you know, satiated until your next meal. There are definitely other appropriate ways to build snacks as well. This is just kind of the simplest version that I like to recommend. And then for dinner, we have a whole grain roll, some cherries, some braised spinach. So to braise it, you would kind of cook it in a little oil, add some water, put a lid over it, let it steam. Really great way to cook leafy greens. And then they have um, like some baked pork chops on the side. So they have all of that. And then you could serve it with a glass of milk and have your dairy. So it doesn't have to be complicated, right? Good chance there's a lot of foods you already like that could easily be made a my plate appropriate meal. Uh, kind of a classic is spaghetti, right? So spaghetti, you would have the grains from the noodles. You go for a whole grain pasta, even better. Protein from the ground beef or sausage or whatever kind of meat you like to put in your spaghetti. There's going to be some vegetable from the tomato. And I think it's really easy to add another vegetable. Get a bag of frozen broccoli, microwave it while you're cooking. Boom, you have a second vegetable. And then you can serve it with you know, some Parmesan cheese on top, which just makes the spaghetti even better. There's your dairy and a side of fruit, whatever you like. Um, cherries, cantaloupe, apple slices. You know, it doesn't have to be fancy. And then of course, this is the real world. So we're gonna eat dessert sometimes. And I recommend with dessert, you know, start with just one serving and try and add protein fat and fiber, because we're talking about nutrition for brain health, we want to make sure we keep our blood sugar steady. Um, because as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, if our blood sugar is dipping, that's actually really hard on our brains because they need that glucose to function. Other parts of our body can burn off fat or protein for energy. Our brains cannot, they can only use glucose. So we have to have glucose available to them. So we wanna make sure if we're eating a dessert, that's usually gonna be high in sugar and it may make us prone to a blood sugar spike. And we can kind of mitigate that by adding in some protein, fat, and fiber. So I say, if you're gonna have ice cream, make it a sundae, add some berries, some fresh berries to it. That's gonna provide fiber and some crushed nuts for protein and a little bit of fat. And of course it's ice cream, so it's gonna have fat in the ice cream as well. Uh, if you want to have something like a brownie or a piece of cake, you could put pecans in the brownies. If you like nuts in your brownies, I know that's a hot topic, but um, you know that's one option and drink it with a glass of milk. Milk is going to provide a little bit of protein as well. Or maybe have a piece of fruit with it to get that fiber in. And if you're still hungry after one dessert serving, 
please do not go hungry, right? Just go eat more dinner. <laughs> it's okay to have seconds or thirds. That's the great thing about my plate is, you know, there's not really any restriction with it. If you eat a full plate of food and you're still hungry, just go back and get some of everything. Have a little bit more roll, more pork chop, more spinach, more cherries. Add a little bit more milk to your glass. Try and eat everything in ratio. And you can go back as many times as you need to to feel satisfied and full. And if after that one serving of dessert, you're still hungry, just go back and get more. Keep that balanced meal uh, as kind of the focus of what you're providing your body. So as far as supplements go, you may be seeing all these nutrients thinking, oh, maybe it would just be easier to take, you know, a supplement or a multivitamin, something like that. Most people can safely take a multivitamin and up to one gram of omega-3 fatty acids daily. And I have listed some of the brands that I recommend. These brands are known for, um, you know, their products are high quality, they're third-party tested, and they use the most bioavailable forms of vitamins and minerals. That word bioavailable, what it means is that the vitamins and minerals in the capsules are going to be in the forms that our bodies use. Sometimes if you just go buy whatever supplement off the shelf, it's going to have nutrients in a form. Our bodies have to convert them before they can use them. And in that conversion process, we can lose other nutrients that are used to convert it. Um, we're not going to convert hundred percent. So we won't get the full dose of that supplement. Um, and so if you have access to these other forms, I personally recommend either the thorn brand, they have a 50 plus formula for both men and women or pure encapsulations is another brand. Their 50 plus formula is called longevity. Um, they're both about a dollar a day per dose. So still kind of in the drugstore brand. Uh, price range, but you would have to order them online. And then for omega-3s, Nordic Naturals is another great brand. Of course, if you're going to take any supplement, it's great to talk to your doctor or you can schedule an appointment with me or another dietitian to just make sure there's going to be, there's not going to be any drug nutrient interactions. It's not going to affect your medications or anything like that. We always want to use safe supplementing rules and, you know, food is always safe. Um, unless, you know, you have a very specific situation, in which case you probably already know about that. Um, but it's always great to go with food first. There's really a lot less risk when it comes to including food sources of nutrients in our diet. Um, so always start there. So just kind of my disclaimer. And with, new, with uh, supplements specifically, it's really important to remember that too much of a good thing is not always a good thing. With supplements, sometimes we will absorb more than we would from food and we can end up having overdoses of certain nutrients and that can lead to any consequence raging from just unpleasantness. If you take too much niacin, you can get niacin flushing, which is kind of like hot flashes and having to go to the bathroom a lot. You know, you just have to pee a lot um, to get rid of it. Too much vitamin C can cause diarrhea. You know, these are uncomfortable, but then, you know, overdosing on something like vitamin D can actually lead to calcification of the arteries. So we want to make sure, you know, we're using a safe dose of the supplement, talk to your doctor or a dietitian to make sure you're using an appropriate amount. Usually the bottles will have, um, a recommended dose that is within a safe limit. Um, but we don't want to say, well, you know, this is supposed to be good for me. I'm just going to take as much as I can because in the long run, it can actually hurt our bodies. Um, some other habits uh, with wellness that can promote brain health are adequate sleep. So sleep is really important for our brains. It helps with memory formation, learning, um, and it's been shown to really protect the hippocampus, which is where a lot of um, you know, issues with our brain initiate. So good recommendation is seven to nine hours a day. All of us are going to be a little different in our sleep needs. I am more of a seven nights or seven hours a night person. My husband, he's more like a nine or 10. So, you know, it's really different just based on the individual. 
Um, but making sleep a priority is really important when it comes to protecting our brain. And then exercise. Exercise, again, helps support the hippocampus. It's really great for brain health. So the minimum recommended amount is 30 minutes a day for five days a week. And it's great to, um, you know, elevate your, um, you know, you want to exert yourself. So feel a little bit of exertion, aerobic. That's the word I'm looking for. Sorry. Um, if you can do aerobic exercise, if you're physically able, that is going to provide the most benefit. And then finally, stress management. It's amazing how many diseases stress plays a role in the development. Um, of course, we know mental health. So anxiety, depression, bipolar, stress plays a really big role in these conditions, but also stress plays a role in developing you know, heart disease, diabetes, um, all kinds of different health issues. So by learning to manage our stress, we can really keep our bodies in a calm place. We're gonna have better digestion when we're managing our stress, which is gonna help us get as much nutrition from our food as possible. <laughs> and we're gonna feel better and it's gonna be easier to do these things that take, help us take care of ourselves. So doing our best, of course, on all of these. Um, there is a balance between you know, good health and kind of the mental load we can manage as far as making all of these things happen. So it's really important to always find that sweet spot for yourself. Um, hopefully this presentation has been informational. We'll take questions here in just a moment, but if you have any other questions or if you feel that a one-on-one -on -one appointment would help you, um, this, here's my contact information. It's also on the back of the handout. I work at the wellness center that's just down the road and I specialize in weight management and digestive issues. And then brain health is my personal passion topic. So I'd love to talk to you more about that if, if you have something, but um, thank you so much for coming and I hope you all have a great day and great brain health. <laughs>